Good morning. Would you turn in uh, your Bibles to Mark chapter 7? Find your place in verse 1. When I was about um, your age, I played the violin. I was in about uh, my last year playing the violin um, by the freshman year. And there's a reason behind that. Um, one of the things that my parents noticed early on, I, I was fine when it came to the technical aspects. I worked hard because I was required to practice. But they would say, your heart never seems to be in it. You don't seem to have any joy in the playing of the violin. And they weren't wrong. I played it because I had to, um, but I didn't love it. And you could see it. And this is the point, is no amount of practice could change the fact of my heart. Nothing that was done outside of me, and nothing that I did from an external standpoint, could make me love the violin. But if you asked me, would you like to go and play baseball with the neighborhood kids today, uh, you didn't have to ask me twice. You see, my heart produced certain actions, and so you could say something about me, about who I was. Well, this morning as we come to the passage, what we're going to find is a group of people, the scribes and the Pharisees, who tried to solve their heart problem externally with more practice and more rules and more regulations. And Jesus confronts them to show them that they've entirely misunderstood the problem that needs to be solved. So if you found your place in chapter 7, would you read with me, follow along with me as I read, beginning in verse 1, and I'll read to verse 23. Now when the Pharisees gathered to him with some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem, they saw that some of his disciples ate with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands, holding to the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other traditions that they observe, such as the washing of cups and pots and copper vessels and dining couches. And the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? And he said to them, well did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. You leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men. And he said to them, You have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your tradition. For Moses said, Honor your father and your mother. And whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. But you say, if a man tells his father or his mother, whatever you would have gained from me is Corbin, that is, given to God, then you no longer permit him to do anything for his father or mother, thus making void the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down, and many such things you do. And he called the people to him again and said to them, Hear me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him. But the things that come out of a person are what defile him. And when he had entered the house and left the people, his disciples asked him about the parable. And he said to them, Then are you also without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile him, since it enters not his heart but his stomach and is expelled? Thus he declared all foods clean, and he said, What comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. Well, there's a lot in this passage that may be difficult for us to relate to. We live in a different culture than Jesus lived in. We live in uh, different times, and we don't have the same kind of rules. But I hope that we'll see, as we look at the Pharisees, that we actually can relate to a lot that they did. Because though it looks different, we tend to do a lot of the same things. We think of the Christian life as a set of rules. If you've grown up in the church, if you've gone to Sunday school, you've heard a lot of things that you should do and a lot of things that you shouldn't do. 
And it's easy to get into the mindset of thinking, that's what it's all about. If your friends came to you and said, you know, you, you are a Christian, I know. What, can you tell me about that? What does that all mean? We were tempted to say, well, we go to church on Sundays. You know, there are things that we don't do. There are things that we do. And that's what it's all about. And we tend to forget that we're called Christians because we follow Christ. And we don't even mention that fact. Well, as we look at the Pharisees, let's explain what's going on here. Mark helps us along, and it's one of the nice, helpful things about the Gospels, is oftentimes Mark's writing to an audience that doesn't quite understand what's going on, and so he gives us this explanation. The Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands, holding to the tradition of the elders. This is not the sense of you have dirt on your hands and you have to, have, you have to be clean before you eat. It's not about getting rid of germs. But it was a ritual thing. It was a symbolic thing. That you couldn't eat if your hands were considered what is unclean or defiled. And there were all kinds of ways that a person could become unclean. If you came into contact with something that was considered unclean or someone that was considered unclean. If you had a certain kind of disease or if you um, had a certain life event, things could cause you to have this status that was called unclean. And they tried to deal with this problem with washings. Now certainly in the law that God gave to Moses, there were washings and, and cleaning, uh, ways of cleaning yourself that were prescribed, but they were reserved for the priests. Um, oftentimes that the priests, when they went into the temple, they had to wash their hands and they had to wash their feet in a certain way. And that was to symbolize their need for cleansing. That they couldn't just come into God's presence as they were, but they had sin that they needed to be cleansed of. And the washing was meant to symbolize this fact. It wasn't actually making them clean before God. Well, Along the way, this group of people that were very religious, the Pharisees, they developed rules that basically extended those regulations to all of Israel. And so they would require everyone to wash before they worshipped in any way. And they would require everyone to uh, even wash before they ate their daily bread. So you see what they're doing is they've added rules on top of God's law. And Mark tells us that they did this in a lot of different ways. So the Pharisees see that Jesus' disciples are not following their rules. They're eating and they haven't washed in, in the very special, peculiar way that they expect them to. So they come and they ask him about it. Now we could see Jesus could simply respond by saying, well, you know, let's think about your rules for a second. I, I think that you're a little bit misguided and let's have a conversation about that. They'd agree to disagree in part ways and everyone would be happy. But he doesn't do that. He addresses a deeper-seated problem by confronting them for their hypocrisy. He quotes the prophet Isaiah saying, Well did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites. This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. You see, what Jesus is saying is that all of their worship is worth nothing. Could you imagine what that would be like? You come from church on Sunday, you've sang hymns, you've heard a sermon preached, you've prayed, and someone tells you what you just did, worthless. Not worth anything. That's what Jesus is telling them. In vain do they worship. Why? Because it's all lip service. It's not worship that comes from the heart. It's like my example of when I played the violin. It was all formal. It was all about the technical aspects of it, but there was nothing in my heart that made me love it. And you could see it. You could tell by my body language. So Jesus says that that kind of worship is worthless. Then he gives them a concrete example. He's not just going to make a vague accusation, but he's going to tell them exactly how they put aside the commandments of God. And so, let me explain this situation here. There was a practice back then whereby a person could take an oath and they could say, um, all of my property or perhaps my house or something is devoted to God. So it would be like this in our present day. You grow up and, and your uh, parents become ill and they need you to take care of them. Back then they didn't have nursing homes and they didn't have um, insurance. 
you were your parents insurance policy and so your parents say you know your father can't work in the field anymore we need you to take care of us he said you know there's a problem my house that I live in that I continue to use is Corbin it's devoted to God so they'd go to the scribes and they say you know I made an oath devoting this to God but um, I'd like to get out of that oath because my parents need help and what the scribes would say is no your oath is valid you have to keep it so Jesus is not making this up and he's not exaggerating when he says that you no longer permit them to do anything for their father or mother in other words because of their rules and traditions they've told them you cannot keep one of the Ten Commandments you cannot honor your father and mother so Jesus has exposed their hypocrisy that they value the commandments of men over the law of God and he shamed them and he silenced them so as we move on to verse 14 then what we see is that Jesus is going to summarize all of this in teaching as the crowds come to him he tells them hear me all of you and understand there is nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him but the things that come out of a person are what defile him of course Jesus disciples don't quite understand and I'm very glad that they didn't understand and that they asked him even though he says are you still without understanding because oftentimes when I read the Gospels there are so many things that Jesus says that I don't understand so I'm very thankful for the explanations and for the fact that they were a little bit dense um, I can sympathize with that and I think that we all can a little bit so Jesus is going to explain what he's saying what you eat essentially it goes into your stomach and it goes out of you it passes through you it can't truly defile you but what defiles you and when I say defile what I mean is is what separates you from a holy and righteous God the sin that separates us is what comes out of our heart I'm probably the most fortunate dad in the world I have a two-year-old and a five-year-old and they've never wet their beds they've never spilled their milk never not once it was always something that happened to them they, the milk spilled it spilled never once have my children said I spilled the milk you see the point we're so accustomed to thinking of sin as something that happened to us as something that's outside of us but not something that we did not something that came from within us but what Jesus is teaching us is that sin is a heart problem at the, at the end of the day it points to the desires it points to the, the inner self that gives root gives cause that produces this fruit so for example in his Sermon on the Mount Jesus tells the people he says you have heard that it was said you shall not murder but I say to you if anyone is angry with his brother he's committed murder in his heart see what causes a person to murder it's not something outside of them it begins as anger and anger becomes hatred and then when the person hates then they commit murder do you see sin is something that comes out of our heart and what Jesus wants the crowds to understand is that the problem that we have at the end of the day is a heart problem let me put it plainly in this way we were created by a holy and just God and there are certain implications of that truth because he created us there's nothing that he cannot demand of us whatever he says we must do we must do we can't say you know it's not fair that you require this of me after all he made us and what God requires is holiness he says be holy as your Heavenly Father is holy can any of us say that we've accomplished that of course not and it's not just a little sin here and a little sin there something that we've done but it's not has nothing to do with who we are I mean, we've heard that so many times from people when they make a mistake and it's in the news and it's broadcast on TV that's not who I am the problem is is that is who they are and that's who we are because of our hearts that produce sin we're separated from a holy and righteous and loving and good God hopeless and helpless 
And the Pharisees offered the wrong solution. Their solution was rule after rule after rule. If we just get rid of all the sin in our lives with enough rules, then, then we can come before a holy and just God. Jesus offers a different solution. And this comes back to the theme for the week. Who do you say that I am? You see, if you've been reading in Mark's Gospel to this point, one of the things that you've seen about Jesus is that he often is criticized by the same group of scribes and Pharisees. He's criticized because of his associations. He dines with sinners and tax collectors. He heals people who have leprosy, people who are unclean. He speaks to Gentiles and he heals them of their diseases. This is not something that someone should do in their mind. But that's exactly who Jesus is. He's the great physician. He's someone who says, I did not come for the righteous, but to save sinners. So Jesus comes offering to solve our heart problem. Do you see? All of this, all of Mark's gospel is leading up to that one climactic moment when he goes to the cross and he suffers and dies for us in our place to solve our heart problem. The sin that should have separated us from God, he took upon himself, he became separated from his Father for our sake. So that through trust and faith in him, through belief in him, we can be forgiven of our sins, we can be cleansed of our sins, truly cleansed from the inside out. And we're given new hearts. In the passages that follow this one, Jesus is going to go through uh, regions that, where Gentiles live, and he heals several people. Once again, healing people who come to him in faith, but people who the Pharisees would have considered outcasts, unworthy of God's love, unworthy of God's promises. But that's the kind of Savior that we have. One who comes to needy sinners, one who comes to helpless sinners who have heart problems, who recognize that it's us, that it's our problem. And instead of trying to solve our problem by being good enough with our own works, turn to him in faith and ask that he would cleanse us of our sin. Ask that he would change our hearts. And he does. He changes our hearts so that we are then enabled to love God and to serve Him from a heart that genuinely wants to worship Him. And of such people, He would never say, your worship is in vain. So this morning, what I'm calling you to do is to consider that Christianity, the Christian faith, is not just about rules and not just about regulations. It's about trusting in Christ. It's about putting your faith and trust in Him so that He can change you, so that He will change you, so that you can live a life that is pleasing to Him, not to earn His favor, but out of a heart that is changed, a heart that loves Him. Let's pray. Father in heaven, You have given us such a Savior as Christ, who did not reject us and did not look down upon us as uh, worthless and people who could not be saved, but who came to uh, the least and the last, who came to helpless sinners and extended your love to them through his sacrifice for us on the cross, through his offer of salvation. Lord, I pray for the young men and women here that you would work in them to... Uh, implant your word in their hearts, that you would uh, bring them to an uh, abiding trust and faith in you, and that you would strengthen their faith so that they might look to you not as a great rule giver who tells us what, just what we can and cannot do, but one who offers to change us so that we can live a life that is pleasing to you in your power, out of a heart that loves you. Lord, we Thank you for your word that is clear and your revelation to us through which we can know your son, through which we have salvation. Pray for the students as they go forth this day that you would give them the ability to practice and to study well so that they might glorify you in their gifts. And we thank you for the gifts that you've given them. 
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.